Um, I want to introduce um, our speaker tonight, uh, Don King Wong, actually, someone I've known for a very long time. Actually, I first met Dong in the fall, 26 years ago, in the fall of 1997. We were both 17 years old. We took our first drawing class together, and I remember the drawing because it had a bass pedal and a snare drum balancing on a flame, um, and it was a lot cooler than it sounds. So we became fast friends because in undergrad, we were the only people um, who got up before 8 o'clock on the weekends. <laughs> and Don called me usually at 7.30 on Saturdays to grab breakfast. We bonded over corned beef hash and a mutual admiration for each other's work. And I toured as a roadie with his band. Um, and we lived in a condemned building together on 51st Street in Oakland. And we named our future firm New Team. Um, when, we applied to grad, when we applied to grad school, we turned his parents' garage into our first office, and we worked on our portfolios there together. We surfed in the morning and worked on our portfolios all day, and we ate burritos for dinner most nights. <laughs> and um, back then, I don't think I could have imagined this day um, as adults, sort of. Following grad school, our career paths veered in very different directions. I became a historian, but Dong um, became the architect I thought he'd always be. Um, that is to say, fun, wildly creative, intelligent, and humorous all at the same time, um, but always driven by a concern for something bigger than the both of us. Um, he's gotten famous enough that it sounds like I'm name dropping when I tell people I know him, and not only that, um, he's my best friend. But I'm here to tell you today, um, he actually really is my best friend, and um, he's here to prove it, <laughs> and I really couldn't be any proud of him. Um, I will leave him to introduce you, uh, uh, you to his work because it will speak for itself. Um, and tonight I just want to introduce my best friend, Don Huang. Many wind turbines in Beijing. 
um, a farm and city plan in Croatia. Um, this is a master, not a master plan, sorry, a boardwalk plan we just worked on in um, Atlantic Beach in Virginia. Um, and then there's a, so that's to say there's a, a good part of our work is always civic, even if it's kind of pseudo civic. Another part of our work is very commercial. So um, one of our earlier projects was we did um, a stage for Travis Scott and Nike. Um, we designed the Visa stage for Kanye West in 2013. And that was the beginning of a long stint of work we did with Kanye until about 2018, um, including, it must have been 200 different designs for Yeezy stores that will never see the light of day, probably for good reason at this point. Um, <laughs> including one for Gap, which looks extra fascist. <laughs> um, we designed the studio in the um, history of Calabasas. We also designed Henry Kim's home in LA. She had a couple homes for them in LA. Um, as you can imagine, this is a very weird period. I won't say weird, a very interesting period for the office. He was also, I believe, our first paying client, which is a very um, unique first paying client I spoke at. Um, but that also led into a work, I think, that deviated into some residential. This is for a small house in Hong Kong, a house in Jamaica, a large house. <laughs> in Dallas, um, and we're working on a hotel down in the Caribbean. Um, that also introduced us to the late Virgil Abloh, and we did the first uh, six stores for Off-White, where right Off-White was um, kind of starting to take over the world. Um, this is in Singapore, in New York, in Tokyo, and in Shanghai. Um, we're at the same time we were redesigning Target stores. Um, I'm guessing this one never also did both. Um, and started working with some other friends of ours, the Benjamins in Istanbul, um, and we did a small store for Hypebeast, uh, another fashion kind of company in Hong Kong, and we just completed their headquarters. This is actually around the corner from our office in Chinatown. Um, if there are only two retail stores that they have. Um, so I wanted to obviously breeze through a host of work and kind of get to the lecture part, I suppose. Um, so to go outside, like I said, there's two parts. The first part is very direct, so we just about going outside and basically finding ways for architecture to either open up to the outdoors or possibly bring the outdoors in. Um, there are certain products that are very taking this diagram very literally and kind of expanding. In this case, it was an a office proposal in Copenhagen of expanding these floors up, so not only was there new circulation um, and ventilation through the building, but again, you could find ways of capturing wind as it moved through the building. Um, this is for a church, also in Denmark, and the idea was simply just to lift, lift the body of the church up, um, and so you get a connection to the riverfront. Um, a museum we did in Finland. Um, the idea was as you move through the museum, circulate the museum, circulate through the museum, you're always going back and forth from the gallery space and the nature of this island that it was on, even if the gallery is um, having a bit of a reminder of where you were looking at you. Um, and our first permanently built structure was the very first off-white store um, with Virgil. This is in Hong Kong. Um, and the, my, my proudest part of this, anyway, is that um, the first third of the store is what you see here with vegetation. It's not meant as a retail space. All the retail happens in the back third. Um, but from a practical level, we fought really hard with the weather seal that is the door that closes the store is back here. And this has a security gate, but when the store is open, this is open to the elements. So if it's humid in Hong Kong, which it often is, it's very humid in this, in this kind of garden space. If it rains, it gets wet. And so the idea was to uh, almost import a piece of the park that's a couple blocks away as an introduction to um, the store. And I'll, a ton of credit obviously goes to Virgil for willing to carve out a third of what would otherwise be a very expensive regional environment um, to do something a little weird like this. Um, but I wanted to, in this section, I'm going to focus on one project, and in part two, I'll also focus on one project. Um, I wanted to focus on a project that we're basically finishing now. Um, construction, I'd say, about 95% done in Grand Canyon, um, down in the Caribbean. Um, it is for a bathhouse. Um, it's gotten some visitors so far. I don't think it's quite open to the public yet. Um, I haven't been down in a couple months, and it's actually um, hard to tell how far it's gone to go in person. Um, but the site is obviously where it's circled. It's part of a small hotel called Palm Heights, which is this building here. And the, the kind of crucial thing I suppose about it was that it was just a, a dirt parking lot that the hotel used for storage. There was a funny temporary Hertz rental car there. <coughs> and it was a site that um, you're a block away from the beach, so why would you ever bother going when you get to the beach? 
Um, but when you go to the Cayman, if anybody's been there, living probably anywhere in the Caribbean, it's very hot. And the, as soon as you get out of the plane, you're hit with this wall of humidity in a way that the environment, the kind of natural climate, and the vegetation is everywhere you go. There's no escaping it. And our whole idea was don't hide from it, don't run any air conditioning, which is prevalent in all the buildings, obviously, in Cayman Islands. But since we're doing a bathhouse, we're doing a place where you're going to just sweat anyway, just sit outdoors. Um, and so that was the concept. The concept was basically to take a big hedge or just a bunch of plants and carve out spaces from them. And so I wanted to run through a little bit of the process. We do a lot of model making, and as that kind of refinement happened, or let's say the initial ideas were, were pretty rudimentary, but the idea was that you were within spaces just surrounded by planting. Um, and as that developed, um, you know, the spaces got a little bit more precise, the model making got a little bit more precise. Um, the space has got a little bit more detailed, and in conjunction, I think what was interesting is as the clients started seeing the project develop, they also added, kept adding more stuff. So I think as they were getting excited about the concept of the potential, they just kept adding more and more things. Um, suddenly there was a gym attached to it that we hadn't planned on before. Now it's six pools as opposed to I think, the two that we started with. Treatment rooms, a head maze, all these weird things. So the good thing is when you're working with plants, Hypothetically, it's very easy just to put in more plants. Um, so in this whole process, obviously, we kept refining the, the design. Um, but part of the, the get outside-ness of it was besides, obviously, that we wanted to use a lot of plants and kind of be outside a lot, was, um, oh, sorry, I skipped the whole section. I just wanted to run through kind of as the drawings developed um, from kind of zoning diagrams and material diagrams into drawings that we obviously um, distributed to the contractors and the builders. Island plans, obviously a large drawing for all different pools and details. But what I was going to say is, um, from a get outside point, because I'm sweating my ass off, um, <laughs> trying to enjoy myself in a mock up, no one was crazy, um, was that um, I don't know if it's unique specific to where we were on this island, but whenever you were down there, it felt like you were in this total bubble. Um, obviously, it's a kind of tropical, very, very tourism heavy place, but um, you just have really no incentive to have any communication with anybody outside of this island, um, which is great when you're there, but it means that when we're not there, we had very little visibility of what was happening outside. And so we had to go a lot. You know, had to be, as if it was a bad thing to always go to the Islands, but um, we would go and discover all these things that would happen on site without people telling us, um, and obviously going to do physical markets would be important. But for example, um, I think we'd been away from the site for two months. The idea for the project was really it was all plants, no structures. We went down there and suddenly there were two buildings built on site, or two structures built on site. Um, and only after the fact did we find out that the client had decided to put in new buildings. And he had enough justification to it, and he also paid us, so we were like, okay, what to go with it. But um, it was one of those things that I think if we weren't there in person, um, we would never have known about, and then suddenly someone else would have designed buildings. So we had to scramble to redesign buildings as construction was already happening, or, or design new buildings as construction was already happening. Um, but eventually, um, like I said, it's, it's nearing completion now. Um, some of the spaces look pretty beautiful. Um, some of the planting is evolving from, originally we had wanted to do really kind of tightly controlled hedge work, or hedges. And um, there's two different plant types that we're looking at that were um, native to the island. And we eventually landed on much more tropical, in a way, kind of classically canon looking plants. Um, simply because it's, it was, we didn't really want to fuss with controlling the plants too much. So I was going to back up a little bit. It went from something like this, that I think is very architectural, let's say. But the more we literally spent outdoors at the nurseries and working with the plant people, the more it became apparent there was just no way to do that. And actually, it was much nicer to let the plants grow as wild and let them kind of go. So, um, I'm very curious what it looks like now. I think these pictures were taken about two months ago. Um, as you know, I do plants grow incredibly fast there, and the idea is eventually they get to about 10 to 12 feet tall. Um, but what's interesting, at least for me, from a, from a designer point of view, is that um, it is the most outside of a project we've ever done. Um, it's somewhere between a landscape project and an architectural project. Um, it's a project where I think that kind of level of discomfort when you first get off the plane, let's say it's like sweating, becomes a real asset. You sort of just sit in that sweat, I suppose, in this space. 
<clears throat> um, but the idea also that in any other bathhouse I've visited, which is frankly not that many, um, there's a level of exposure that was always kind of uncomfortable to me. And so we wanted to create a place where there are lots of small pockets that you kind of find yourself in or hide in or create for yourself um, in this kind of hedge maze or plant maze of a place. So the, the second part of the go outside this um, is much more about the profession. And um, the next few slides are a little unfair, but basically they're, they're grabs of, in some ways, um, the leaders of the practice. So this is the board of directors for NCARB. NCARB is the entity that basically determines um, who becomes a licensed architect or not. Um, this is a couple of large firms, KPF, SLM, Gensler, um, and then the, the board of directors for the AAA. And I would say with, with a few exceptions, very small exceptions, um, you know, we were looking at this that this doesn't feel like our people, I guess for lack of a word. Um, didn't feel like there was a lot of representation for the, the friends and collaborators that we're working with. Um, it didn't really feel like this was a profession that was um, built for us. And so the go outside was always, is there a different way to operate architecturally? Are there other things we can do as an architecture office? Um, and so a couple things we've been doing as an office is we started a list called BIPOC Studios List. It's a running list, um, open to the public, basically just highlighting black and business and um, POC-owned studios all over the world, primarily designed architecture studios, some engineering studios. And this came about that we were, um, a lot of students especially were reaching out to us, um, obviously this is off the back of 2020, 2021, and being very uncomfortable in their studios and not having, not being able to have the kind of conversations in the studios that they thought they could have. Um, and so we just wanted to kind of compile this list. I think it's up to about 500 uh, different studios now. The other thing we did was we started a radio station. Um, this was down the street from our office where we interviewed um, creatives, uh, architects obviously, designers, musicians, chefs, um, and basically asked them how they made money. Um, and the intended audience was, um, first and foremost, I think, um, kids in Chinatown. So Chinatown, where we are in New York, is a, a very low-income neighborhood. It's also a neighborhood where um, it's actually very common for kids as they grow up to take over their parents' businesses, whether they're restaurants, laundromats, insurance companies, or, or small kind of insurance companies, like I mentioned before. And the idea of doing an artistic profession seemed a little fanciful. So, we wanted to be very direct, and one of the questions was, how did you make your first dollar, and how do you survive, or actually thrive now as a creative person? And we recorded all these, these are all online, you can watch, but what we did was we just took over a small storefront for a couple months, built out an open studio, invited people to come by, um, and just recorded what it was like, in a way, to have a design studio on the street for a couple months. Um, we ran a number of events, cooking workshops, drawing workshops with a public library that was across the street. Um, and I said, like I said, um, this is all online, all online now. Um, we're hoping to do a second series called Paradise. This is about the influence of other work in the Cayman Islands, um, but trying to understand what everybody's version of Paradise would be. Um, the other thing we started recently, this is in the last year and a half or so, is a Mahjong Club. Um, and we've done four of them now. The first two, or sorry, the first two and the last one run out of our office. Um, the third one was a little larger, and we did it in conjunction with the nonprofit here at Welcome to Chinatown. Um, and it's, that's really all it is. It's a modern club. And um, in this case, these are photos from a defunct uh, Dimson Parlor near our office. And the intent of it was um, we started playing Mahjong in the office, I think around 2021, when um, we wanted to see our friends, but I think we were still a little awkward socially. And so it was really nice to be able to sit with friends, hang out with friends, but not really be forced to talk to our friends. <laughs> and that kind of grew into um, this club where um, each session we had anywhere between 50 and 150 people come play. Um, from an office point of view, well, sorry, from a modern point of view, um, most people don't know how to play, and that's kind of part of the fun, is we're also learning the details of it. Some people are pros and kind of just basically kick everybody's ass. But well, the reason we wanted to do it also was um, in our work, we talk a lot about working with communities, we talk a lot about creating civic space of some version or another, 
And we basically just wanted to try to put our money where our mouth was and create spaces for ourselves or um, literally fund our own kind of spaces even if they're very informal and small and easy to put up. And just see, see if we could actually put this with like um, And so Modern in a way was kind of our excuse. Uh, the dream for this is to eventually build out a community center in Chinatown um, and make it more of a permanent fixture in the neighborhood. Um, in addition to that, um, part of the, uh, these, so these projects are what we classify as sort of initiatives in the office, again, kind of getting outside of our typical client based work. Um, I've personally recently started doing um, artworks, <laughs> I guess. Um, I was invited to design a chair, which is the thing on the left. Um, it's basically a staples game and chair stuck on top of an Amazon cooler with big materials. And then the thing on the right, I'm, set, I'm obsessed with these pots. And um, I basically just use those, uh, you know those cake tins that look like fish? So I basically just use those, put a bunch of clay into it, um, and glossed it, and made what I'm actually very proud of as a sculpture. Um, but the initiative started when the office, even first, even before the office started. And so I wanted to kind of get a little, a little time on one project, which is actually probably our oldest project, certainly our, our longest standing project to date. Uh, which is called Plus Pool. It's a project for the East River, or let's say the rivers around Manhattan. Um, and it's a pool in the shape of a plus. Um, but its, it's trick is that it filters water. So it basically acts like a giant strainer, and you can drop it into the East River, and without chemicals, it's able to filter water in the walls of the pool into the body of the pool that's actually cleaner than most public and chlorinated pools. Mm -hmm. That water then gets filtered back again through the walls because actually people are even dirtier when they swim in it than the initial water user. Um, and that goes back into the, the river originally. So um, this project started um, when I first started the office and really had no client prospects. It was basically the kind of project we wanted to do. All I really knew how to do was put together nice imagery and design a thing. So that's what we did. Um, the, the sort of intent, I suppose, for the project was ultimately to, to find a way to connect you with the river physically and tangibly, but in a way that was fun. So um, one anecdote that I love is that we've now from a nonprofit around that we've had for a few years, one of the board members who I think joined probably like six years ago, three years after joining, I don't remember what we were talking about, but it was like, wait, it filters water? And I, I was like incredibly annoyed that after three years of talking to him, he only just realized it filtered water, but I realized that he had joined the project, put in tens of, tens of thousands of dollars to support the project purely because of this image, and it was cool looking, and that was it. And actually, I thought that was so important that something that was just kind of viscerally, viscerally interesting or just kind of cool looking could actually sneak attack in a way, have a big impact on how people related to the river around them. Obviously, in order to pull this off, um, we had to figure out what filtering water meant. Um, when I invented the idea, I basically Googled how, how the Buddhas work and <laughs> blew it up into an architectural scale. But um, over time, working with Columbia University, working with Arab engineers, um, we tested water ourselves here on the uh, East River. Um, we set up a temporary lab on the East River and tested across 16 different parameters. Um, slowly evolved that into in-water filtrations that were floated on, in this case, the Hudson River. And over time, basically collected more data than I believe has ever been collected in terms of water quality on the East River ever. Um, a big reason for that is we were collecting every 15 minutes, um, obviously with the intent that any time you would jump into the pool, you would know the permanence of the water. Um, everybody else that tests the river is really looking for long-term health, so they're looking at graph samples a week or two spread apart. That wasn't really helpful for us. Um, and eventually that led to a patent on the filtration. Um, somehow I have a patent now. Um, and again, a random result of a silly idea. Um, so I think the architecture is interesting, but at least in terms of, actually what I find more interesting is how it happened. It happened with a simple idea, and it happened with us and our friends Play Lab, basically just putting together a website and a newsletter and trying to distribute it to friends. Um, that ended up picking up a ton of press in the summer that it launched. Um, it got a lot of attention <laughs> and allowed us to run two Kickstarter campaigns. Um, this is when crowdfunding was nascent. Kickstarter, I think, had been around about two years. Um, and so even that was a novelty. But we raised over, over $300,000, and all of that went back to the testing 
to develop the project, and eventually from that, the results get city support and again build up the nonprofit and the board. Um, one of the way, ways we um, love to raise money, but try to involve people with to sell tiles. Tiles range from $75 to $250, for example. But I like the idea that you could technically own a piece of New York, even a very small piece. Um, and that's now turned into a pro uh, nonprofit that has swim programs, educational programs. We throw fancy parties, as a lot of nonprofits do. Um, and this was, I think, about four years ago. We built a much smaller version of the pool. Um, it's not swimmable, but um, it's just a light installation that changes color depending on the water quality of the room. Um, so in this case, blue meant it was actually clean. Um, it changes to a pink. It was very unique. Um, but it was nice to actually get something in the water. And our site that we've been talking about the city on uh, about is actually right back here. Um, I coincidentally live about two minutes this way, and my office is two minutes this way. Um, it is actually the closest site to both my home and the office that we've ever picked um, in New York, and that is purely by chance. Um, but one thing we noticed uh, midway through the project that we were doing completely accidentally was if your classic project starts with policy, the client taking advantage of that policy, finding funding in a site, building a routine, and eventually arriving at a piece of architecture, we accidentally did that backwards. So we had a design first, we didn't know where it was going to go, we didn't know who was going to pay for it, we didn't know if the city was going to like it or not. Um, but what was nice is the design really has not changed, at least in principle, the technology obviously has evolved, but um, the intent of the project has stayed pretty true from day one, and that's very rare um, in the practice. Um, and I think that was, it was never an intention at that point, let's say, to go outside of the um, way of building the piece of architecture, but we just didn't know any better. Um, and that kind of, I'm going to end on this again. I didn't know why I would end on this, obviously, with the exception of the dynasty. Um, <laughs> but I will say, I think it, it was, um, A, just to thank Diana for inviting me, but also I think, like, knowing Diana has been one of those things where, um, you never quite want to do things how they're supposed to be done, I suppose. Um, sometimes, hopefully, usually for the better. Um, and also that it's, our kid is really fun. And I think that's usually to the thing. So if you get to work with Diana, or get to have Diana as a professor, um, enjoy the time you have with her. Anyway, thanks. Thanks, Diana.
in the practice, it was sort of trying to balance that research side with what is your gut telling you to do and trying to put that in a visual as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, this, this came in one is roughly what we do in terms of the process and how it develops through a project. This one's a little different because there's a lot of live design as constructions happening, which doesn't happen quite as often. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. That's great. It is functional. Okay. Um, and then, like, my, I guess, like, more serious question is, um, you talked a lot about how you have, you do a lot of, like, big international, almost, like, design work, but then you also have a lot of local community engagement. Do you see them more as, like, do you see any intersection between the two? Yeah, for sure. Um, even the work, I mean, I think a lot of it actually comes from, we're the, we started doing more international work at the beginning of the office. Um, the New York work is relatively new for us, as I think we've established more of a name in New York. But the international work, we were finding out very quickly that the success of the project was totally due to, I mean, not, not only the local conditions, physical again, social political, but actually who we were working with. Um, it was incredibly specific whether that's partners or contractors or just the neighbor that was next to the site. And those really small local conditions um, were so influential on, on how the work turned out and even how we um, came up with ideas. So like the off at Hong Kong store with all the plants in the front, that idea came about because I think I was just wandering around the neighborhood where the site is in and um, I don't see the park. But there's a big public park two blocks away. And Hong Kong is such a retail heavy city that I just ended up going to sit in the park just to have a break from all the high end retail. And it was that crossing back and forth in the park and this very concrete retail thing that basically is if you look at the diagram the store is really half plant, half the other side of Hong Kong. Um, when we started doing stuff in New York, uh, I think it was off that realization how important the direct connection of the, lo the local site was. Um, but also that feeling that we were, um, yeah, talking a lot about working with communities, but were we actually doing that? Um, and also that even if we were ultimately the agency lied with how the client wanted to operate a space, um, what happened in the space after we even left the project, um, and so things like Mahjong Club, like the radio, were ways that we could take a little bit more agency and actually have conversations that we wanted to have that were even just you know personally beneficial to myself, you know, learning how people went from an idea into becoming world famous chefs, for example. Um, I feel like I actually forgot the specifics of your question, but that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do I see what? Do you see like maybe like a direct result of architecture that you're like things that you're building in like China or New York? You're saying a direct result in terms of how we design? Oh like yeah. Okay. Do you like like do you see a direct result of after your like know, community engagement that uh, ties in directly uh, to like local projects?
And we noticed that simple action of just offering free tea gave people an excuse to come in and sit down for a while. And I feel like it's the same thing like when you go to a coffee shop. I feel like if you don't buy a cup of coffee, you feel weird sitting there. Mm -hmm. And almost like buying a coffee grants you the permission to like hang out there for now. And so when we were giving someone a cup of tea, we would notice that they'd suddenly like take it and like sit like at a table, that funny scooby table. Whereas if they didn't have the tea, they would look around and then kind of like awkwardly leave. So very little things like that. Um, things that arguably are not really architecture, but are so tied into the experience of how someone uses your space. Um, I'm, I'm also very curious how or if that's influencing like our sort of more traditional architectural work. Um, I had a, at Berkeley, I had a professor named, uh, what was his first name? We just called him Professor Whitaker. And he was, I think, the oldest professor in our studio year. And he was not as much a professor, am I doing this? I don't think I'm doing the Whitaker thing. He was not as much a professor as he was just like a storyteller. So he basically come in and not teach you anything. He would just tell you like, tell you, like anecdotes, and anecdotes about his like, long history. And the one that always stuck with me was, he was like, whenever you design a house, make sure on the landing you put a bench. <laughs> and the reason you put a bench is so when the grandfather is walking up with his grandkids, he has a place to sit down and read a book. And it was like the most like touching, cute thing I'd ever heard. But literally, like every time I design a stair, I'm like, where's the, where's the grandpa bench? <laughs> um, and I don't think I've actually designed a grandpa bench. But I, I, I would like to think that there's some version of like, where's the tea service? That shows up in our work. Um, they'll be asking me in like two or three years before I actually pull it off. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm really interested in how you kind of incorporate these almost environmental lab, like science experiments into your design and how you find clients who are on board with that experimentation. How is it weird to say that? You guys want to see? Is it, what was your question? How do you do that? How do you incorporate the like, little like, science experiments into your design and find clients who are on board with it? Um, we generally just don't tell them. <laughs> uh, it, it is actually very hard to, it's hard to convince a client or something like that. I mean, with Cluster is different because it wasn't really a client. We, we ended up learning how to water test. Again, later by Google <laughs> that works. And then on the back of one of the newsletters, we had we helped with and we listed off every discipline that we could think of. One of them was water filtration engineer, which is actually not, is kind of a profession, but not really. Like we were just guessing. And so we would just kind of cast a wide net, find people, if they were the wrong person, we'd find someone else. In terms of convincing the client to do it, I think we found it was easier just to do it ourselves and then show them the results and get them excited about it. And I think from a business point of view, we've got a little smarter when we just sort of like slide them a little bit extra food to do that. Um, I mean, we want height of food, but we just like increase our percentage based on the main target. Like um, but I think it's very hard to walk a client through it before they see what the benefit is. Um, because most clients are like, either they've done architecture before and they know, kind of know how it works, or they haven't, and they're very nervous about where it's going. And often when you're trying something more risky, they'll like, turn to suicide food. So it is sort of like you just have to have to initiate it and hope that they see the payback when the results are good. Mm -hmm. So as a kind of you know, established architect at this point, what's one area either in your own personal skill set or in your kind of um, your firm's mission as a whole that you're looking to continue to develop? Um, this is probably very mundane, but the, I, I think that the hardest thing is always, now that we're starting to get a few products built, it's always like, is the actual built thing, even if it doesn't look like the is it actually doing what the agenda of the concept wanted it to do. Um, I don't really know how you measure that. Like some, some plus goal, for example, is actually a really measurable problem if that rates work. But you can actually measure how many people are swimming, you can measure how many gallons are filtered in the pool. There's ways to measure success in that way. Most other projects don't have that 
a scientific way of measuring it. Um, and one is actually like we're trying to build that in the interview office to almost audit projects after we finish them. Um, again, it's something that we have to do on our own because no client's going to pay to do that. Um, but basically, I think similarly to doing, I mean, it's also the reason why we wanted to do food data and is because you can see the results immediately. Our people come, basically, are people interested in what we're doing. Um, that aspect, that aspect of connecting what is a very idealistic concept to the built thing, now that we're doing it in a few built projects, is hard, I would say. Um, and we're just sort of like learning as we go. Um, and hopefully that kind of that becomes more and more one to one in some ways. Or maybe even the building is surprisingly working even better than we could have thought. Um, it came in as one of those projects where it actually conceptually is the same as we said, but it looks a little different because of the planting, for example, because of all the sort of live changes to the construction site. Um, and I don't know how it's being used. Um, there's an aspect of it that's being used in a very hyper luxurious way, which we think we already, all we knew was going to happen. But there's also aspects of it where, like, people that are otherwise very uncomfortable being naked um, in, uh, frankly, what is very typically very white kind of bathhouse spaces are like, this is actually, like, I love it here. And like, those kind of little moments feel like very much successful or what we intended originally. Um, but it's also a project where I think like, people will end up using it in ways that I can't. And all things exciting. How would you describe an architect's um, role in determining a community's um, like daily habits and routines, or do you have any goals for New York that you want to change in terms of influencing the people there? Or? Um, what was the question how I want to influence New York? Like, how would you describe an architect's role in determining, oh, like, the community's habits and, yeah, and if you have any goals for New York that you want to achieve? Um, I, I want to say that an architect's role is basically just a service, it's a serve a community, or a neighborhood or a city, which means trying to understand and be background enough to basically create like a shell or a frame or a platform or whatever it is for the community to kind of have. That's really tricky because even in the most sort of like hands-off way you are imparting some way of reading what you think of the community is needed and doing, there is a lot of like personal agenda there whether you want or not. Um, one of the reasons I think we, we try to do a lot of initiatives in and around Chinatown is it's the first neighborhood I've actually felt a part of. Uh, partially because I'm, I'm a big artist because I'm Chinese, but also because I live and work pretty much in Chinatown. And even that feels like every year it feels a little more comfortable to be like, okay, this is actually becoming my neighborhood as well. And I can feel fair to ask or see how the changes that happen in Chinatown. Um, other neighborhoods, otherwise, we're basically just trying to work with partners and trust those partners. Um, but Chinatown, for example, it's a really interesting neighborhood in that it's, I think, in my mind, probably one of the only neighborhoods in Manhattan um, that is relatively resistant to gentrification. It's, it's, I mean, obviously it's changing like everywhere else, but a lot of that is because of how the ownership structures of a lot of the properties are. Um, there's a lot of land trust, there's a lot of like buildings that are owned by 50 different families, so selling it is almost impossible, which is amazing. It means that the communities stay in Chinatown, but it also means it's very hard to update Chinatown. Um, I was updating Chinatown in a myriad of different things, but in order for in order for Chinatown also to survive, I think it also has to economically thrive. A lot of the industries that were there pre-9-11, pre-COVID, are no longer there, a lot of the industries that are coming in. There is a really interesting young creative community, but do they have a foothold in terms of where Chinatown goes? And so part of the Mahjong thing was also decided like to build up groups of people to actually have communities, to have space for people to come, come together, um, especially reserved for kind of like younger Chinatown people that 
either they have creative mindset or that have different ways of um, progressing the kind of who is now. Um, but it, it is really tricky if it's not a neighborhood they don't, that I feel like I'm not a part of, which obviously most of the work is in neighborhoods that I'm not really part of. Um, and so in that respect, you're basically just either trying to do your homework or just working with someone local as a lead on what the community might do. Yeah, I know we're hogging the mic over here, but it's something which I really thought was interesting about the work is this focus on uh, sort of small objects and creating environments based on the, um, or sort of creating emotional and physical sensations in the work. I, I'm getting a lot of that, and like in the water and the retail environments, it's obviously very object focused and such. And I guess well, what I'm getting that is a little bit to the last question about sort of lifestyle and the way that some that a lot of this work has to do with sort of lifestyle and also uh, kind of how it's mediated through social media in a sense. And I wonder what sort of what the role does um, social media either as like pragmatically as publication or I mean publicity or as design tool um, informs your work. Um. Is this on? <laughs> All right, maybe I don't need it, but uh, so tell me if it's too loud. So I'm interested in how you think uh, about uh, the, or, or don't, uh, uh, about the uh, issue of, uh, of historical relationships vis-a-vis uh, -vis site, plan, building, 
etc., etc. And what inspired the question was thinking about the pool plus pool project is the one uh, that the ones that you showed, uh, and that got me thinking about the the, the large uh, WP era WPA era New Deal pools around uh, the boroughs uh, of New York City uh, built in the 30s. Uh, the one I know most experientially is the Sunset Park pool in uh, Brooklyn, and whether there was any sense of, uh, of uh, relationship in your mind uh, in, in the kind of historical context, in a way, those pools kind of metaphorized uh, for, for the public very much uh, uh, the uh, extent to which uh, life in New York City as a totality was uh, surrounded by water and, and, and one circulated one's sense of life and vice versa around and through and, and over and under uh, water uh, and brought that experience kind of into a more graspable neighborhood uh, embodiment. Okay, and, and here you have, you're taking it into the rivers themselves, in a sense, at least in what you showed us. And I, wonder, I just wonder whether there's any thought about that that went into the project or not. Uh, I will say there was not when we started. Or there was not, the, the, I can remember the day I thought of the idea, there was certainly not thinking about how it tied into the pool systems or um, the relationship of the waterway to civic life, except that I was sitting on the river and sweating a lot. And I was like, it's hot. It would be great to jump into this river, which is disgusting. I'm not going to do it. But, uh, it that was it. That was like purely it. But what was interesting is I think even that moment encapsulates so much of what you're talking about, where your life in New York is oftentimes like surprisingly on the water in a way that I think I certainly never thought of the East River, the Hudson. Uh, like, I don't think of Manhattan. I always forget that we're on Island. It's very fun, especially when you're looking at the private Cayman. It's like, oh yes, we're actually on the island. We're surrounded by water on four sides. Uh, like you said, you go over, over and under the water every day, multiple times often. But touching the water is not something that's part of your understanding of your um, There was a moment where, I can't unblink my name, but the city planner of New York at some point, I think not talking about a pool, but talking about the health of rivers in general, the further the rivers, the sixth borough. And that, the sixth borough out of the five um, in New York, and that was sort of a revelation that it, it is public space. Um, it's public space that you generally get away from or move over <laughs> and not spend time in. Um, but that was amazing. It's like, oh, of, of the public space that's really underutilized, there's a lot of it right there. And could we, could we do that? Could we actually use it? And, and one of the nice things was, at least in, originally the intent was, nobody at the moment sort of owns the East River in terms of any of the public school. Public pools are so tied into the neighborhood they're directly physically around them. In the river, there's a little bit of a sense of stepping away from that um, that felt very open. Um, you know, as we got further and deeper into the politics in New York and the ocean models and all that stuff, uh, that became a little bit less of the case. But I am certainly very happy that the location we have now is in Two Bridges, which is in the Chinatown, a super low income neighborhood, a uh, space that uh, there was very lacking in public space, let alone public space that's very exciting. Um, but to that point, also, one of the reasons um, that site was offered to us, let's say, is because uh, de Blasio, when he was mayor, fucked up and basically allowed for these uh, super high and luxury apartment building to get built in this weird housing loophole. And it was getting so much political fact for it that he wanted to offer, uh, I was going to say a plus, but he wanted to offer uh, something positive. Um, and so we kind of got used as a political pawn in that regard. In a way, they're like, we'll take it. Like, it's a great site. And our, our challenge is to, to not have the pool be used for more of those powers in a sense. Um, but actually, we use the benefit that uh, neighborhood was there for. 
Anyway, um, we learned a lot about public pools probably in the first month. We connected with um, historians that were looking at public pools for a long time. We connected with this woman named Ann Buttonweiser who built, um, turned a floating barge into a pool and parked it in the Bridge Park for a number of years. And all of that was ties in, and there's such a long history of public pools and swimming in New York. Um, exciting and troubled history. So it was exciting actually to be part of that. Um, almost accidentally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it is, it is a 
big reason why we started Radio Mahjong. Because I think, this is not really anything new, but as our office was growing and becoming more of a business, a lot of that was due to taking on clients who were more typical clients. Um, I think we've been pretty fortunate that like, even if a client is a kind of typical type of client, they approach us for work that is not typical. They approach us for work that they've never done before. Um, which I think is a really nice, uh, weird narrow window of an office to be in. Um, you know, like right now, our, our most significant client, from the pain point of view, and actually the different client we work with, is for all intents and purposes a very normal client. They're a big company, there's lots of management to go through, our contracts are pretty straightforward, we're hitting out of the walls like any office does. And we needed the release valve of doing really client less in the way things like Mahjong, or making our client not the person who pays us, making the client the person who uses the space. And those are not oftentimes those are not the same things. Um, when, when Plus Pool started, it was like a dream, like, oh, here's a model that maybe we can keep pursuing. And we have pursued it in much smaller ways. I think one of the things we remember was that this is a huge project, and we started it in 2010. It's still going. Um, and it's also, all the politics around it are terrible. Not terrible in like, well, I'm not terrible. Um, in ways like, shit, this is what it takes to get a project done in New York City. Yes, I guess this is what it takes to get a project done in New York City. And it's, it's, a pain, it's painful. Um, So it's kind of also made us, okay, well, there's a version of that that's really great. Do I want to invest myself in another 15-year project again? Not at the moment like that. Um, so we went super small with the initiative projects and are slowly trying to go back up into, let's say, a medium size. And actually maybe another large size. Um, we've also been really lucky that like, we've had clients that are, feel much more like collaborators um, Virgil is one of those. But kind of to a certain degree. Um, and I think a lot of it comes down to how, maybe how good they are at design, I guess, and how quickly they can respond to ideas and offer back ideas. Um, but those are also very rare. I think you can learn from that. But Kanye also, frankly, himself, might be very easy to duck out of that <laughs> orbit, um, sadly. Uh, but in the meantime, it was also like, we were also wondering, like, how do we... Because there was a moment where he actually asked if I would come in and run his architecture office within uh, Donda, like the company itself. Mm -hmm. And I said, like, I'd love to, but I also have an office that I like. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I can't give it up. And so there was a moment where we talking about the halftime thing, but it ultimately didn't work out. But there were moments where, like, oh, I can either fully go into this or find ways to go out. And um, I think for that point, it was always, always a fear of getting stuck with one kind well, I want to thank you for coming here and talking to us about your work. It's been an incredible privilege, and um, again, a little, a little surreal, but um, I love having you here, and uh, I thought it was really wonderful. Thank you so much for talking to all of us. Thank you.